So far away, Lucas, what are the odds on this one getting monetized for its title? Oh, uh, really low. Yeah, it's weird though, isn't it? Because there are loads of people who are Nazis on YouTube, but we can't make money for making fun of them. We'll do it anyway. As the numerous comics and films and TV shows he's appeared in have all too well demonstrated, the Marvel hero Wolverine has a healing factor that can help him survive near enough any injury. A skill the man with adamantium claws once used during World War II to scare the living f out of a Nazi officer. Yeah, so I'm personally aware that like Wolverine fought during World War II, but people might be thinking, Wolverine? Fought in World War II? Yeah, he's really old, but his healing yeah. factor stops him aging very fast. Yeah, so for, so long story short, Wolverine is probably the most fuckable 100 plus year old in the Marvel Universe. Uh, because <laughs> that's, that's saying something. It though, is, Carl, there's, a lot of that's true. there's a lot of characters over 100 years old in that universe, but Wolverine's probably up there among them. And uh, he has uh, the uncanny ability to heal from near enough any injury, uh, a byproduct of which is that he ages incredibly slowly to the point where at over 100 years old, he still has the vitality and physical appearance of a man in his prime. What is your favourite, like, old man version of a superhero? Because there's a couple that are really good. And, like, Old Man Logan is a good one, and that's obviously been um, adapted into the Logan film, which is fucking phenomenal. But do you any more, like, old man superheroes you quite like the idea of? Because, it's like, that trope is quite common. Is it cheating to say Professor X because he's always an older <laughs> He's always old as fuck. Well, uh, <laughs> no, I definitely think that like one of my favourites, at least that I've experienced you okay. know, reading or watching, is the Batman from The Dark Knight Returns. Oh, uh, where, where he's, he's just given he's up. Like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> he's just given up and he just beats people up. <laughs> he just drives race cars and wears his like, robot armour to beat just up Superman. He punches Superman with steamroll fists. <laughs> it's like, you get, everyone gets to a point in their life like, fuck it, I'm gonna go punch someone with steamroller fists. I think one of mine is in an Avengers cartoon um, where the Avengers are fighting Thanos. And it's a really interesting fight against Thanos, actually, because each of the Avengers' specific power sets counters one of the stones in the Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, for example, he used the Time Stone to turn everyone into an old man. And, like, and he points at Captain America and he just turns like a withered old man. And then he points at the Hulk and the Hulk, as the Hulk lasts a bit longer, but still manages to like, you know, succumb to the ravages of time. And then he points at Thor and Thor just gets a grey beard and long hair and says, You fool! Asgardians only get stronger with age! <laughs> so he can't use the Time Stone on him. Anyway, bring it back to Wolverine, the extent of his healing factor has never been fully clarified by the comics, with some showing it as being almost unbeatable and others showing it as being a bit more reserved. But at its absolute limit, it is shown that Wolverine can recover from a single drop of blood. And for anyone wondering, how, how do they explain how Wolverine can recover from a single drop of blood? Um, his powers are increased by a weird alien crystal. However, in comics where he doesn't have his powers empowered by an outside source, he's still ridiculously strong and able to recover from what you would assume would be completely disastrous injuries, such as being burned all the way down into a skeleton. And in fact, the worse Wolverine's injuries are, the better his healing factor is, because the more severe the injury, the more his healing factor kicks in. So injuries like that, he actually recovers from faster than like you know ones like cuts and things of that nature because his body goes into overdrive and no one really knows like what the exact limit is because he has an indestructible skeleton. And one of the things that's really weird about Wolverine is that if he didn't have the indestructible skeleton, his healing factor would be better. Yeah. Because his healing factor is constantly fighting adamantium poisoning, which is how he dies in Logan, isn't it? It's like, oh, your healing factor can't keep up with the adamantium poison anymore. And I love that Wolverine sometimes uses indestructible skeleton or like, you know, the classic is just the fastball special. It's like, fucking throw me. Yeah. <laughs> Where Wolverine, he's just like, fuck it, just throw me at him. Throw me. Now. Damn it, Logan, don't do that! He's indestructible, and even when he's not indestructible, he can be healed almost immediately from any wound. Yeah, I still think that the fastball special is not utilizing Wolverine to his full potential. I think Colossus should grab him by the ankles and swing him around. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Just, oh, oh. Because if he gets his claws out and holds his hands outstretched, that's basically like a spear. 
that's that's a close combat and a long range attack there. It is, because then you can throw Wolverine if you need. Or just like frisbee him really hard. So do you know, like you, when characters in video games ragdoll? Mm. Imagine Wolverine ragdolling as you like throw him like a ninja star. Getting back to World War II, while numerous comics have alluded to the fact or even centered around Wolverine's antics during World War II, very few of them actually broach the subject of the horrors of that war. Which is, you know, it's understandable, isn't it? It's a comic book at the end of the day. You don't want to really broach the subject of, like, the Holocaust in a comic book, but there's always so many comics you can make where you say Wolverine fought during World War II and he's supposed to be a big hero without addressing that fact because the more stuff you introduce talking about Wolverine fighting during World War II the more awkward it gets that he didn't help yeah yeah it's like you know the, the whole problem with Harry Potter at the moment where they're like you know those Grindelwald movies are now leading up to World War II and they've have to like for years they've been saying oh, what why didn't the wizards stop World War II and oh well, no no these we don't want to talk about it because you know the books are set in the 90s but now they're setting movies back when World War II is happening and like why would you willingly open yourself up to try to answer that question? <laughs> it's never going to be satisfying. Yeah, their only excuse is just that, oh, they don't meddle in Muggle activities. But when it's that activity is potentially yeah. blowing up the entire planet or killing an entire race of people, you'd think they might have a little something to say. You'd you think they'd make an exception in that case, wouldn't you? So uh, in regards to Wolverine, um, there is actually one comic that addresses this fact, um, simply titled Prisoner Number Zero, which takes place in there, and I... Hope I pronounced this correctly, because this is a real place where 200,000 people died. Um, the Sobibor Extermination Camp. I'm really sorry if I mispronounced that, but that is a real place where real people actually died, and a comic writer thought would be a suitable place to set a story featuring a man with an indestructible skeleton. As you said earlier, this is why comic books, such a silly medium, try to skate around because things of of such yeah. gravitas, because it's hard to talk about that in a way that's it is. also a comic book that kids can read. And my mind always goes to that amazing advert for Call of Duty World War II, which I contend borders on experimental art. They don't know they made art, but I think that they did, because Call of Duty World War II was set during World War II, and in the lead up to it, the developers were talking about how they were going to show the Holocaust, and people were asking them, that's a really heavy subject to address in a Call of Duty game. How are you going to treat it with the reverence and respect that it deserves? And they paid lip service to the fact, like, you know, we're not going to, like, you know, make it into a game. Like, we, we're really, really dead set on showing the horrors of this conflict and not gamify it in any way. And then they released an advert for the multiplayer. That's a group of knobheads walking around going, let's get the squad back together. I can't wait to snipe people in Call of Duty again. And it's just those two things juxtaposed next to each other are fucking hilarious. Haven't you heard? Call of Duty is going back to World War II, baby. We gotta get the guys back together. Yeah, we do. The comic itself is actually pretty good. And I think they do a really good job of uh, like selling like, you know, the solemnity of that um, period in history. Because Wolverine mm. never utters a single word. It is a comic that's told nearly entirely without any dialogue. Oh, right, okay. And what happens is, is that Logan is silently stalking the camp's new commander after the last one mysteriously committed suicide. And the, and the commander is understandably suspicious of Wolverine's inherent aura of power. And what he does is he orders that Wolverine be killed, only to be surprised a few days later when the same man he swore he had killed is back, staring at him. And you can probably see this is going, right? I mean, I'm presuming he orders Wolverine to die over and over for yep. Wolverine to keep coming back. Yeah. Yep, he orders that he gets shot and then thrown into an incinerator and for Wolverine to once again return and just stare at him through the fence. And eventually the commander's feelings go from ones of annoyance to those of fear when he faintly recalls a story about a young boy who used his mind to tear apart an armoured car. And that's obviously an allusion to, like, you know, Magneto. And that's, like, you know, Magneto's story is, like, you know, very intrinsically linked to the Holocaust, or at least it was when they retconned his character and then retconned it again, which I guess we can get to in a moment. But um, this commander starts to suspect that maybe this mysterious man who cannot die may possess powers similar to that of the, the small child who tore apart that armoured vehicle. What happens is, is that the commander eventually just goes insane because he has been stalked by someone he swears is dead, and his paranoia eventually results in him killing himself, is when us, the reader, realises, oh, this is what Wolverine did to the last guy. The reason this commander had to replace someone who commits suicide is that they were driven to insanity um, by Wolverine. 
And this comic does end up getting pretty fucking raw because uh, the, the commander does not have time to uh, you know, stew on their thoughts because they are informed by their men that there is a guy stood in the gas chambers who refuses to die. So, uh, so Lucas, they went there. They, they went there. And the commander is forced to go into the gas chamber and confront Wolverine eventually. He drags him out and then starts torturing him, asking him for information, like, why won't you die? And, and Wolverine does not utter a single word. And what happens is, is the commander tries to beat the information out of Wolverine and then accidentally knocks over a candle, which sets his home ablaze, um, resulting in Wolverine walking out and watching him horribly burn to death. And the comic ends with Wolverine once again stood there, alive and well, as a new commander comes to the camp. And, Dear God. And you know, that's a pretty metal story. And, you know, it's quite poignant. And, you know, they have a lot of imagery there. And it's a, a very somber. But at the same time, could Wolverine have not just whipped out his claws and murdered fucking everybody? <laughs> That's the issue, isn't it? Yeah, it's, like, it's a, oh, that's that's like, a it's, really harrowing story and like, oh, Wolverine's like mentally torturing this Nazi commander who, you know, mm -hmm. is a Nazi commander. For and, um, yeah, absolutely 100% deserves it. But yeah, could he not have saved all of these people from also being murdered alongside of him? And that's why I don't know how I feel about this story because it is an interesting story and it, I read it and it is handled quite well, but at the same time, it just... The fact it exists makes you ask that question in your mind of is there not more that Wolverine could have done? This one's gonna be this is this one's gonna be a fucking rough one to edit, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> because it is so difficult. You know, this is an entertainment channel, but at the same time, whenever a subject like this gets broached, it's like we have to be immediately clear that we do not agree with anything that the Nazis are, you know, people who would align themselves it's politically with them. weird that I them. have to be on record saying that I disagree with Nazism. And it just goes to show, you know, the discourse has been poisoned around it, where, you know, and it's by design, by, you know, white supremacists and people on the alt-right. They want to muddy those waters so that these discussions, are even, like, the fact that these discussions are even taking place is beneficial to them. It's just fake, like, Nazis are, like, the last acceptable victim in media where you are not, you do not feel bad for them. It's like when you're playing like um, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 and you can just encounter the Ku Klux Klan and they're the only NPCs in the entire game that you can kill and not get in trouble for. And in fact, you get good moral points <laughs> for killing them. It's like they good. are like... A, an ex yeah, it's like good. And the only people who'd ever argue against that, you immediately just go, hang on a second. Is that, why are you saying that it's not nice to punch Nazis in the face? And then face? they always try and do that thing of like, well, I don't think you should hurt anybody. It's like, well, that's fair, but why is it that you draw the line at Nazis? Why mm. is it that specifically Nazis getting hurt makes you say this? And not when, like, you know, countless other kinds of people are subject to... Um, uh, admittedly, you know, they're not getting burned alive in, like, comic books by Wolverine, but, you know, bad shit happens to them. Why is it you draw the line when we start making fun of the Nazis? And if it's why like, is in some it cases, that you, you're finally willing to stand up for somebody? Yeah. When it's like, you know, the, the most abject pieces of shit in existence. <laughs> yeah, the murder is wrong. But at the same time, when your ideology is actively calling for the extermination of an entire kind of like group of people, like that is so inherently violent in of itself that it could be argued that, like, you know, punching Nazis is self-defense. Like, I'm, not I'm not going to go and murder a Nazi, but if I see BJ Blasco, it's like snap someone's neck and they happen to be a Nazi, I'm not going to feel sorry for Yeah, that. and it's that same thing, like, you know, the whole thing like punching Nazis in public, it's like their very existence is a threat to other people's right to exist. Because by letting that one Nazi exist, you are letting everybody else who does not fit within their um, uh, horrible, poisonous, toxic ideology um, does not have the right to exist alongside them. How many times have we had to shut down people being bigoted um, like, you know, on our streams and our discords and stuff like that, because they think that that sort of thing will fly because they get away with doing it on other content creators and um, uh, um, socials and things of that nature. Yeah, it's not like it's a daily occurrence for me, but I've had it enough times that, like, it, I can't count, that's for sure. And it's just, oh, well, a lot of the time it's like, you know, it's better to just let, let people say what they want to appease your fans. It's like, yeah. no, I do not want any bigots in my community get the fuck out. Yeah, and how like, we've had to do it multiple times. Uh, and that's the thing as well. You have to shut it down straight away. You can't have any argument there because the moment someone starts arguing for their right to be bigoted, they are automatically discounting the rights of like, you know, the, the minorities that they are like disenfranchising with their words, like, don't matter. It's like, we then they give do. A shit about human rights. <laughs> we do, yes. And again, you have to pull it up by the roots. You can't, like, say, it has to be stamped out immediately. 
because the moment there's any sort of wiggle room, there is no compromise between bigotry and accepting people because the only compromise between that is a little bit. And it seems like a lot of like content creators are happy with that the little bit. Do you know the Zac Efron meme of him being like, hey, like that. It's like maybe a little bit as a treat. L just a little bit of bigotry in my community is okay. It's like, yeah. no, no, fuck off. None at all, no. It's like, maybe I could just let people use bigoted language. No, no, none of that. Because the moment you start like saying that's okay, people start to give a mouse a cookie. They'll keep, they'll keep pushing. It's like the, the old saying, isn't it? Like the unreasonable man draws a line in the sand. Take a step forward, he says, the reasonable man. The reasonable man takes a step forward towards the line. The unreasonable man takes a step backwards, draws another line. Take a step forward, the unreasonable man asks. And that's like, well, it's just a slow decline into this like horrible bigotry. Unless you'd be like, no, fuck you. Respect people's right to exist.